You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke your host and the Gratitude Guy podcast. My mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests that I have every week. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. and it's on the Pacific Standard Time, that is, on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, and other podcast outlets. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And as a side note, I do do keynote speaking around gratitude and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com, as well as david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And then I'll have my show notes and contact information in the show notes as well. So let me get on with my favorite part of the show every week and that is my special guest this is no exception kurt meyer let me tell you a little bit about kurt kurt is a u.s navy veteran from the naval and nuclear submarine force he spent almost 20 years at a fortune 300 global industrial gas manufacturer his strength is in working with small business owners on turnaround management leadership development and ownership transition strategies he recently joined iba the oldest business brokerage firm in the northwest as their vice president of business development He looks forward to continuing to serve the entrepreneurial community area that we love, including military veterans transitioning from active duty to civilian life as new business, new small business owners. His practice brokerage and franchise consulting services employed the best practices developed through the years of IBM and himself. So, Kurt, welcome to the podcast. Glad to be here, David. I'm honored to be your guest. Thank you. It's great to have you. And, and I start out, I, I always sort of start and end with the same two questions, but just for context for the listeners and viewers, because I do put this out on YouTube as well, uh, tell, the, in, tell the viewers and listeners how you and I met. Well, geez, it's been about a decade, David, and we met in a uh, professional business networking group called Biz and Rich. And it was a a fantastic group of a uh, mixture of small business owners, attorneys, CPAs, wealth advisors, like-minded individuals that really like to give first before asking anything from uh, any of the members. And uh, we met once a week. And I remember that you were an absolutely wonderful moderator, really oh, kept everybody you. energized and uh, amped up. Thank you. Thank you. And you just used a couple of of terms that I really like is give first is really it's important as some of us have got the color of hair that you and I have uh, have been around for a while and so I think you learn well what's your mission what's your point and certainly to give first and help others and it's certainly a big part of it I know it's true with you and the second term you use which I love is like-minded because there are just certain people you meet they're just on the same page and we all come across people that are not like-minded and they're more center focused and they want to talk more about how you can help them and what you can do for them and how they can advance their whatever and so on. But, but so speaking of context, step back, you've had a really, I know a lot about your career from our chats together, but step back and go back kind of in the beginning. Cause I, I see it as three or four kind of big chunks and it might be more, but I think at least three or four that you kind of really pivoted which is a great word that we've heard a lot used more in the last year or two since the pandemic, but kind of start after college in the early, uh, and maybe the service, but after the service and kind of walk us through maybe some of the big chunks in the early years. Absolutely. You know, I've really been blessed to have three distinct careers, David. Uh, The first part, as you noted, was in service to our country in the uh, Naval Nuclear uh, Submarine Force. And, uh, after I, I left the Navy, um, I joined a Fortune 300 company. And typical of folks leaving the military in the mid-80s, you went for the biggest, baddest company you could. 
thinking that that company would train you and take care of you for the rest of your life, right? Mm -hmm. Think General Electric, think Weyerhaeuser and all the rest, think Boeing. So I went to work for a firm called Air Products and Chemicals. I started in the field in Phoenix, uh, moved my way up through various assignments, including one in uh, Malaysia as an expat, which was very interesting. Oh, wow. Ended up in the corporate headquarters and uh, ran a number of businesses, including our global helium business uh, with operations you know, throughout the world, you know, Russia, India, Algeria, South Africa, Australia, China. After that, my uh, last assignment was running the North American healthcare business for air products, which meant uh, venturing into the respiratory therapy, durable medical equipment, and infusion therapy business. Mm. And we did that via acquisition. So that's where I got my merger and acquisition chops. Mm -hmm. um, I, interesting, my first year, I was given a budget of $25 million to purchase a company. We ended up buying a company that was listed for $200 million. Oh Shot my goodness! By Goldman Sachs. <laughs> wow! And wow. Uh, we we completed that deal uh, in about a year's period of time, and then uh, had subsequent bolt-on acquisitions of uh, between seventy-five and hundred million a year for the next few years. At oh. that point, though, um, I realized through a combination of things, I realized that uh, you know working for the man probably wasn't. Uh, wasn't the the ideal situation. I mean, I, I really enjoyed my time at Air Products. I uh, I learned a lot, had a lot of challenging assignments. Really enjoyed the people I worked with, but realized that self fulfillment came from owning your own business. Right. And my uh, my wife is a professional. She's in the financial industry, and um, we came to the conclusion that one of us needed to do something on our own, just to give us flexibility with our kids who were young at the time. Quite frankly, I made the assumption that my wife would stay at home for a few years, you know, being kind of old school. Mm -hmm. You know, I said to my wife, you know, why don't you, uh, she's a CPA by, by training. I said, why don't you uh, open a CPA shop and get the flexibility that we need? And I'll continue being the corporate guy until I'm 65, retire and drop dead, because that's what mm -hmm. men do. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she encouraged me to consider entrepreneurship. She oh, said, look, you know, yeah, I mean. She said, look, you know, do you really, do you really enjoy your job? I mean, you know, you're making millionaires of these guys that, uh, you know, you think you're every bit as smart as, you know, what's the difference? I remember she asked me, what's the difference between you and these guys you're making millionaires by buying them up? Right. And I said, well, you know, we've been married 20 years. You know, I like being a corporate guy. You know, I'm comfortable in that environment. You know, my whole life has been one of execution whether it was in the Navy or in corporate America. And, uh, you know, that's my comfort factor. I said, you know, what the heck are you talking about? What the heck would I buy or own? What kind of small business are you talking about? And she said, well, there must be something that you would enjoy that you could either build or acquire. And it would give you the flexibility that we're looking for, you know, with the family. You know, I will continue to be the corporate person in, in my role, in the financial role. Mm -hmm. So the long and short of it was that um, I ended up at the 20 year point taking an early retirement package and I sought out an entrepreneurial opportunity and I did that on my own at the time so I looked at a number of different businesses, this is in Allentown, Pennsylvania so not quite as robust a market as Seattle but right. uh, businesses available everywhere and I looked at a number of them and uh, Quite frankly, I overanalyzed everything. I, I was looking for perfection. Oh, I had lunch with a friend of mine one day and he said, how's your search going? And I said, well, I like this company, but I'm concerned about the market changing, you know, and I like this company, but I'm concerned the employees are going to leave day one. Right. You know, and, and he stopped me and he said, what the hell are you looking for? Yeah. You know? He said, it looks like you're looking for perfection. I said, you're damn right. I am. <laughs> you know, this is my money. I'm going to put three, 400 grand down and I want it to be good. I'll, I'm willing to pay a premium. Mm -hmm. And then he used the analogy with my wife. He said, your wife, Lynn, she mm -hmm. perfect. You know, she's a perfect homemaker, you know, perfect money maker, perfect cook, perfect this, that, and the other thing, you know, of course not, you know, you look for killer concerns. And, and since there weren't any, you married, and you made the best of it and you both improved and you grew together, right? Right. Well, that's what you want to do with the business. And I said, okay. And then he said, but you're not going to do that. And I said, well, what do you mean? Did I make a mistake leaving corporate America? And he said, no, but you have to understand what you are. You're an executioner. 
Mm. You don't have an innovative bone in your body and you won't take a risk. And I said, well, geez, you know, I'm pretty depressed now. What the heck should I do? And he said, you need to consider a franchise. Mm. And my initial reaction was franchises are for wimps that can't do it on their own. Mm. That you've got to pay, you know, an exorbitant franchise fee to join. You've got to pay royalties in perpetuity. So my initial, my initial feedback or my initial feeling was that, you know, are you kidding me? And he said, look, what do you have to lose? Expand your search from existing businesses to franchises. And so I did. Mm -hmm. And I looked at a number of them in a number of industries, uh, from staffing to janitorial to uh, water and fire damage restoration, you name it, mainly business to business. I was more comfortable with that environment than a uh, retail or food kind of franchise, which most people think of when they think of franchises. Right. Ultimately, it came back to the industry that I was comfortable with, and that was healthcare, specifically senior healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I purchased a senior healthcare franchise called Sarah Care. It was an adult daycare franchise where we took care of folks with cognitive or physical impairments that weren't ready for assisted living. So they were still living at home with their baby boomer children or their spouse. And uh, those caregivers needed respite during the day. So they would come to our center from seven in the morning till six at night. You know, their kids would drop them off, go to work or do their errands and then pick them up. And uh, I found it to be a fabulous business, you know. And uh, again, I was an executor. I, uh, I basically took the advice of the franchisor in terms of finding the location, hiring the staff, implementing the marketing program. And David, it was, it was a little scary. I mean, you know, you start off, you've got zero revenue right? and you got 20 grand a month going out in cash costs. And, uh, you know, you know, it's going to take a year and a half to reach break even, but you know, every other week when you're hitting the credit line to make payroll, you're wondering, you know, yeah. and ultimately, you know, we got to that break even. And, and eventually I got to a point where I replaced my corporate income Oh, nice! and I was able to hire a manager and actually become an absentee owner. Mm. In fact, um, we got to the point where I was able to move to Seattle because my wife took on a new position out here and I was able to retain ownership of that business in Allentown because I had the right measures and metrics in place and uh, kept that business for about four years until I sold it to uh, an individual. Interesting. And so and anyway, that was Sarah Care, correct? That was Sarah Care. Yeah. yeah. And so when you said, when you went from not being able to make payroll to hitting the credit lines, to hiring a person to run it and basically ran itself. How long period of time was that? That was about a, a two year period. Okay. And I think that's a, a reasonable period when you're starting something from scratch. Right. You know, you've got to realize that, uh, you know, it takes some time. I mean, yeah. even, even with a proven franchi franchise concept, uh, you know, you have to establish your, your brand equity in the neighborhood that you're in. You know, you have to develop relationships for referrals from doctor's offices and Department of Aging, et cetera. So, you know, if it was that easy, everybody would be starting a business, exactly. Up, right? Exactly. And so uh, through that experience, what happened was that set the stage for the next part of my career. So as you can imagine, uh, you know, when I sold that business, and by the way, I sold it because I had an unsolicited offer from someone that I knew. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, that was lucky. I mean, uh, if you're ever selling a business, you, you want unsolicited offers. Yeah. Don't put any pressure on you in terms of price. Right. So at any rate, I sold it to this, uh, to this individual. And in doing that, I did all the work that a business broker does. I had to value my business. I had to put a, a, a book together on it. Mm -hmm. I had to help him transfer operating licenses from the Department of Aging. I had to transfer the lease with a landlord that was a nasty REIT. Oh, wow. So I had to do all this hard work to get it to close. And after I sold the business, I reflected on both what I told you about my search for the business. Remember, mm -hmm. you know, I was looking for a business and I ended up with a franchise. And then I said to myself, well, then I, I helped myself by selling my business. So I was acting as a business broker, both on the buy side and the sell side. So I thought, well, what am I going to do next? You know, the kids are still in high school. I'm 50 some years old, still have another decade or so to work. So I thought maybe being a business broker mm. would be a great next step. 
And with my M&A experience in corporate America, and then my own experience as a small business owner and as a franchisee, um, I decided to become a business broker. And again, I became a franchisee. I joined the largest uh, premier national brokerage outfit called Murphy Business Sales and uh, established a territory on the east side of Seattle and uh, grew that business over a five-year period from nothing to uh, a very substantial business. In fact, when I sold that business in 2016, we were named the top business and franchise brokerage firm in all of Seattle. Wow. And I ended up selling it. Yeah. And I ended up selling it to one of my agents. You know, I brought agents on and uh, I felt that she was the right fit. And I learned through all of my experience in M&A and business brokerage that the best time to sell a business is when it's of its highest value. So at the end of 2016, I found myself at 59 years old. My two kids were off and independent, you know, through college. Uh, wife was still working in a corporate job, and I wanted to do some other things in life. I wanted to do some traveling. I had some older adults. My parents were still on the East Coast, and I hadn't spent much time with them. I wanted to do some angel investing. Mm. I was intrigued by startups because yeah. I had only done business with uh, established profitable companies. That's what I focused on in my professional career. So I decided let's take a look at this uh, startup world. And so I was involved in uh, the Karitsu Forum, which is a local uh, organization uh, for them, startup, yeah. early stage companies and such. But you know, David, after about a year, after I sold my business, uh, you know, I missed the thrill of the deal. <laughs> I missed dealing with all of the professional contacts uh, that I had made relationships with, you know, people mm -hmm. like you, people like the CPAs, wealth advisors, attorneys that we had in our group way back when. Yeah. And so a friend of mine that I had done a couple of deals with where I represented a buyer and he represented the seller, he owns, has been the owner of IBA for 20 years. And so mm -hmm. when I sold my business, we became personal friends. And I think he noticed uh, that, uh, should we say, I wasn't done yet. You know, I, yeah. I remember yeah. you know, we shared Mariner tickets and he could tell that, uh, you know, I still had, uh, I ha still had some gas in the tank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, he proposed that, uh, that I join him because he was growing the business. He was adding new brokers and he knew that I didn't want to do work anymore because being a business broker, you know, there's a lot of work involved. There's recasting financial statements, putting books together coordinating buyer-seller meetings, doing the negotiations. I mean, the sales process in business brokerage is uh, anywhere from three to 12 months in oh, duration. Wow. And so I didn't necessarily want to get back into the trenches, but what I did want to do was to schmooze, you know, to really focus on business development. Most of our clients at IBA are referred to us by trusted professional partners. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You know, if you're a 75 year old guy who owns a, a small manufacturing business, you don't have any kids in the business and it's time to retire, you want to move on or you have health issues or you want to invest in something else, you need to sell. So, you yeah. know, you're going to have a conversation with your wealth advisor or CPA, some trusted professional resource. And in that conversation, uh, you know, somebody's going to pose the question, well, how the hell are you going to sell your business? Right. And the owner is going to say, well, I don't know. I mean, do I, don't I just put it on the internet in this day and age? And, mm -hmm. and that's the wrong answer, obviously. Or don't I just call my attorney? No, not really. You know. And so these trusted resources will educate the owners and say, look, just like you use me as your attorney or me as your CPA or me as your wealth advisor, you need a professional business intermediary, IBA, Kurt Meyer, to handle this transaction, you have more equity in your business than you do in your freaking house. Yeah. Wow. It has to be done right. And so those introductions are made to us and then we take it from there. So, you know, I, uh, I, I thought about what he had offered and I thought, geez, I can maintain those relationships and then I can participate in various associations where these small business owners are. For example, we're members of the uh, Washington Hospitality Association, where they're the owners of all these restaurants, food distribution companies. 
were members of the Master Builders Association, construction mm. companies, remodelers, HVAC, plumbing and related trades. Uh, were members of the Center for Advanced Manufacturing Puget Sound. Again, privately held, family owned manufacturing businesses with values between say a million and 25 million. And when it's time to sell, who better than us to sell for them? Yeah. And I yeah. love what IBA does for our clients because we're 100% performance compensated. So mm. what does that mean? We're only paid at closing. So, you know, unlike other firms in our industry, we don't charge to do business evaluations. We don't charge fees to market the business. We take no retainers. It costs you nothing to engage wow. us. Wow. We only get paid when it, when it closes. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to make sure it closes, right? We're investing all this time and energy, so we have to make sure that the people that we do business with are people we want to do business with. So we're very selective in the engagements that we take. And like you started this whole thing off about the importance of knowing, liking, and trusting someone before you do something. Right. It's the same thing in our business. I mean, you know, our goal is to make sure that we know, like, and trust our client because if they're not transparent with us, um, it's going to be a painful situation and we're not going to be able to do the right job for them. And we're telling them to trust us in this process. We want them to focus on running their business for the next three to 12 months, however long it takes us to sell the business. And we'll do our job, you know, we'll sell the thing. We'll make sure we get the best price in terms because our commission depends on that. Yeah. So um, I love this environment of, uh, of, of trust. And I also love the fact that we look for win-win deals. And, and it sounds, <laughs> sounds trite, right? Oh, you're, we're seeking the win-win, right? Mm -hmm. Well, here's why we're seeking a win-win. We want the buyer to win as much as our seller. I mean, make no mistake about it. You know, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our seller to take care of them, but it takes two to get a deal done. And yeah. we want that buyer to be successful with what he's buying. You know, we want to help him with the financing. We want to align him with the right attorney to draw up a purchase and sale agreement. We want him to have the right CPA to do due diligence on our books. We want a clean deal, transparent to both parties. And you know where that comes back to, to benefit us, David? The typical small business changes hands, ownership changes hands once every eight years. Think about that. Oh, once wow. every eight years, the business changes ownership. It could be two years, it could be 20, but the yeah. average is eight years. Interesting. So if we sell a business to a buyer, and eight years later, they need to sell. Maybe they're being relocated. Maybe they want to invest in something else. Maybe they have health issues. You know, who the heck are they going to go back to? They're going to say, look, that company, what was it? IBA, they took care of me exactly. when I was the buyer. Can you imagine what the heck they're going to do for me if I'm the seller? Exactly, exactly. So, so, Kurt, let me, so let me ask, it is a win-win. Let me ask you this too, because as you know, gratitude's a big part of this. And you've had these kind of basically these three chunks. And I would assume IBA, just from the way it's gone, is probably your favorite of all of them. And when I find a lot of people that get to be years of my age, thank God they're doing the thing that they love the most because we're getting on the, the last quarter, the last third of our, our time on earth or what have you. And so, but when you look back on that, every time I've ever seen you, you always have a smile on your face and you always have a, a kind word to say and so forth. So my favorite word is gratitude. So if you look back at the career Meyer, uh, Kurt Meyer uh program or, or history, how has that attitude and that gratitude piece figured in for you? Uh, very much so, very much so. I mean, you know, the, the, the gratitude all, always starts with uh, my parents, you know, mm. who basically, uh, you know, wanted to see their kids, all their kids do better than they did. I mean, both sets of my grandparents came over through Ellis Island in the 20s. So oh, wow. my mom and dad were born in the 30s in Chicago. Uh, so my grandparents probably didn't even have a grade school education. You know, they were basically peasants in, uh, in Germany, you know, and, uh, then my parents, you know, blue collar, uh, my dad got out of the Navy, worked for AT&T for 40 years. So, you wow. know, middle-class, upper middle-class, uh, background. I was the first kid to go to college. So I had a great deal of gratitude for having an opportunity to go to college. And I, um, I went to Notre Dame on an Navy ROTC scholarship. Because, oh, cool. You know, didn't have a hell of a lot of money in the family. Yep. And uh, so a lot of gratitude to the Navy uh, in terms of training me to be the executioner that I was. 
a lot of gratitude to those in air products, all the different bosses that I had, the leaders. And I tell this to my daughters right now that, you know, when you're working in a large company, you have to seek out the best and brightest leaders and, and try to get into their heads and learn from them. You know, I mean, you're, you're being paid to do a job. So, you know, earn your money, but at the same time, you've got to build your own equity, especially mm -hmm. nowadays, because, you know, any company can kick you aside for whatever reason. So it's up to you to, to, to build your own equity so that, you know, you can have some choices down the road. So then the other gratitude goes to, um, yeah, certainly my wife, who, as I described, you know, really gave me her back in becoming an entrepreneur. I was the reluctant entrepreneur, okay? I'm not the right. Bill Gates of the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I did it for flexibility, not because, uh, you know, I'm a born entrepreneur, but I'll tell you, you were asking, you know, what did you like the most? Certainly between the Navy, Fortune, fi Fortune 500 career, and an entrepreneur career, it's definitely entrepreneurship. And David, I'm asked that question by veterans many times because I, I do presentations for transitioning veterans coming out of the military mm -hmm. and they have some choices. They can either go to school and take care of the, take advantage of the GI bill. Most of them have to work for a living, right? right. I mean, they got to right. put food on the table, but then there's a small portion that are appropriate to do something entrepreneurial. I mean, they have the skills, you know, many of them are career, you know, uh, senior enlisted or officers. And they do have some money. So I talked to them about the two options they have, one being buying an existing business and the other buying a new franchise. Mm. And guess what? That's exactly what I went through, yeah. as you recall, as I, as I recanted. So I go through what the pros and cons are for both of those. And uh, at the end of these presentations, they say, Mr. Meyer, same thing you asked, you know, Mr. Meyer, you know, if you had to do it all over again, you know, what, what would you do differently? And it's easy to say that I would have left the corporate life earlier, um, but in reflection, staying that long really gave me the skills and experience to be successful as an entrepreneur. So, but certainly the last 18 years of my life have been much more fulfilling, you know, as, as a small business owner. And I think that anybody, I mean, you know, if you study philosophy and you study Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Yep. You know, you're trying to get to that top level of the pyramid, yep. self-actualization, which is yep. where you are, by the way. Yeah, thank you. You know, you're a self-actualized kind of guy. And I think that's where you want to be. And, you know, if you can get there earlier than 46, when, you know, I started my journey, more power to you. Well, or I was so, 62 when I started this journey too, nine years ago. So it's, you're right. Sometimes it takes time and we don't always know the journey. We know we want to go from A to B. We don't always know the path that we're going to take to get there and so on. So, so, but it's interesting too. And, and thinking back on those same people that are transitioning in the military, I'm always curious. So I look at somebody who's been arguably between you and, and, um, uh, your wife, very successful. And then who's going to be the breadwinner and who you both have at the corporate world. You can go out and do the, the franchising and so forth. So you've got the young kid that says, Kurt, Mr. Meyer, you've had some great success. What's, what's the one or two tips that you give him that to him or her that you could say, well, you know, if you follow these couple of, of tips of mine, you got a pretty high chance of success. What would you tell that 20 year old person about after all the years of experience you've had? Well, it's interesting because I just authored and posted a blog article about this last week. So your timing is impeccable. Mm. Um, the, the, the best tip I can give everybody is to remember this uh, very simple equation. And uh, it goes back to me being an engineer and a conversation I recently had with my older daughter, who, by the way, is in a large, uh, you know, Fortune 50 healthcare company. Oh, that, wow. Uh, everybody would know. Um, and we had a conversation about uh, success in life and uh, exactly this, you know, preparing yourself to, uh, you know, control your own destiny. And so uh, I would, my, my, my tip would be to remember this equation. So um, net worth, you know, if, if I ask you what net worth would be, David, you, you might immediately say, well, geez, Kurt, that's a little obtrusive. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. none of your business, but, you know your assumption that worth is uh, assets minus liabilities or how much money you have, right? But correct, correct. I told my daughter, when I asked my daughter, I, you know, she said, well, geez, dad, you know, that's none of your business or whatever. And I said, well, you're making an assumption, you know, net worth can be what your worth is and your value is to your friends, your community. I mean, she uh, volunteers at St. Jude's, for example, and, 
you know, she's doing a lot of things. So her net worth can be measured any way she wants it to. Sure, and sure. that goes for you and me. But what is net worth? So getting back to the equation, net worth equals network. Let me say that again. Mm. Net worth equals network. Mm -hmm. So my tip is that it is not what you know. It's not what degree you have, what credentials you have. You know, it, it's not, you know, what you know. It really is who you know, right? And how you can engage those resources to, you know, achieve goals. So net worth equals net worth. Think about it. Yeah, if like you've that. got a strong network like you do, <laughs> I mean, I don't need to tell you, you've got one heck of an extensive network. I would venture to say your net worth is pretty damn high, David Brooke. Yeah, right? thank you. I, mean, I, you know, you can measure it in dollars. You can measure it in you know, fulfillment to, to causes or whatever, but net worth equals network. So my tip is build a network and mm -hmm. build it the way you were talking about earlier about giving first exactly. and establishing quality relationships, you know, and exhibiting things like trust and credibility and all that good stuff, it will come back to pay you in spades. It will. And, you know, it's interesting, too. I just trust credibility, uh, knowledge, you know, some of these things. That's a great tip, which I always look for a couple of tips that the listeners can pick up from the various guests. And I think when you mentioned self uh, entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur, being self-employed and after the Navy and the Fortune 500 and so forth, uh, I, I think back on, you mentioned a number of, of bosses at Air Products, and I think, and, and being grateful for them. And I think this old line, which I've heard, which is so true, is people leave people, they don't leave companies. And uh, I wouldn't even call it, unfortunately for me, I, I think maybe I'll even change the fortunately. Fortunately, I had two horrific bosses at two companies, both of which you know, very, very well-known companies. You probably know, because you and I have talked before, but they really did me a favor because it got me to get out and, and paddle my own boat and get out there and ride my own bike. And I always, I'd wanted to be a speaker when I was 19 and it took me 45 years to get the guts to do it and go out there and do it and, and make the change and so forth. But it's because it's so easy to fall into that trap of, you know, every other Friday you get that check and you get the 401k and you get the match and all these things, but to go out and really be on your own, it, it takes a lot of guts, but I'll tell you, you're only answerable to the person in the mirror. And if you've got somebody that's got a lot of drive and a lot of power and a lot of self-esteem and a lot of self-drive in them, self-confidence, self-awareness, it's it's not that hard to do it if you just stick your, you know, stick to it every single day. But but I think in, in fact, going back to the net worth equals network, who you know and how you can use those resources, that's such a good tip because it really is about that. And there's somebody you mentioned the daughter working at uh, volunteering at St. Jude. There's so many things that you can do that that have nothing to do with money. And there was a book or article that I read years ago and it said the 10 reasons that we work that have nothing to do with money. And it was really, you didn't, I didn't really think about it at first, but gosh, it was a sense of teamwork and, and being part of something bigger than yourself and, and a contribution and things that it doesn't come through in a paycheck. And which is why I think it's always such a sad thing that the statistics will tell you at any given time, 75% of people hate their jobs, you know, and just, and just despise them. And now you have the pandemic and all these people that won't even go back to work. So they'd rather get the unemployment and stuff. So it's really neat. And I look at your journey and I just think it's neat how at each one of those, you take a step forward, maybe one back and two or three forward to get where you are now. It's really been the culmination of all those different jobs you had to be doing something that, you know, like you said, getting around the buzz and, and doing that and, and, helping people sell their businesses and evaluate them and things like that. I just, I think it's really neat because I think you really kind of self-actualized yourself in your career path. Don't you agree? Absolutely. No, you said it well. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this too. And as I think of tips, again, I want to mention that and we'll wrap up here in a minute or two. Uh, remember this simple equation, net worth equals network, I think is really good. And two, oh, and I want to ask you one thing, one way back when, but just a quick um, for the listeners, what was it like being an expat? What was that experience like? Oh, was that fun? So I was in uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia in the early 1990s. And uh, what I liked about it was that uh, you had three distinct cultures. You had the ethnic Malay people, mm -hmm. you had uh, ethnic Chinese, so maybe 40% of each. And then you had a significant Indian population. Mm -hmm. So they each came with their distinct cultures and religions, very different, <laughs> very different. Yet it was a former British colony, so everybody spoke perfect English. So it was, oh, wow. uh, you know, 
it was, I was very comfortable there. Um, I was also comfortable driving uh, because, well, I had to remember that it was the other side of the, of the road, just like in Britain. Oh, right. Uh, but, uh, but what I liked about it is that there was a heavy, heavy uh, dose of relationship building before any business was done. So mm -hmm. as an example, um, some of my customers were, were Japanese uh, expats, uh, you know, from Tokyo and Osaka. And before we would even talk about the products that we would sell them, which would be nitrogen and argon and other industrial gases, we had to get to know them, which meant playing tennis with them, playing golf, drinking. I mean, we invested six, nine months before we even broached. Business. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Wow. So old school relationship building again, making sure that the, you know, it's easy, it's easy to know someone a little bit, you know, a little bit harder to like them either like them or not, but yep. to trust them, it takes time and it takes sure effort. And uh, once you have that trust though, um, good things happen. So I love the business environment in Malaysia. I love the food. I love the fact that it was uh, close by to Singapore, spent a lot of time in Singapore. And during my off time, got a chance to go to Phuket, go to you know Hong Kong, China, Australia. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of good opportunities to enjoy myself in addition to the, uh, the business. Uh, oh, that's aspect of it. But, but what I also learned was, and again, this was in the 90s, and I think it's true today, there's a different work culture there. I mean, I was in the office six days a week. Oh, wow. And the work hours were like from seven till seven. <laughs> and then the entertainment began at seven. So, oh, I mean... Funny. I don't, I don't know if I could do it, you know, uh, uh, you know, as, as an older guy, but, uh, you know, I was in my early thirties there. So, uh, you That's know, answered the bell every, answered the bell every morning. As you look at some of those values, trust, credibility, knowledge, you mentioned that earlier. And I, it occurred to me one day when somebody said something about trust, and I thought trust is one of those things that can only be earned through time. You can't meet somebody and five minutes later say, Kurt, I really trust you because it's only time that really equals that equation and so forth. So, so I got a couple last questions. I don't normally ask this second to the last question, but I have to ask you in a day and age of a 70% divorce rate and all the people that are out there, you and Lynn have been married for a number of years and you only get to pick one thing on these last two questions. So what do you think has been the key to your successful marriage with Lynn for after all these years? Oh, that's a good one. I would say that the key to it is that you have to recognize that both of you are going to grow and mm. you need to grow from a base foundation. So, you know, we are, we are, have been since day one in sync with regard to the basic values of life. Mm. And so, um, you know, having respect for each other and, and allowing each to grow and not suffocating each other, you know, allowing the light in, allowing the water in, allowing us to grow uh, both professionally and personally, I think has been the key. I mean, we've been married over 37 years, knock on wood, uh, you know, enjoy two fabulous daughters. The one that I mentioned, by the way, the younger one is serving our country. She's a, oh, great. she's a naval, she's in training to be a naval aviator. She's going to be flying jets off carriers or fixed wing aircraft or oh, helicopters, whatever she decides to do. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of, uh, it's a matter of growing together, recognizing, you know, you're not going to grow exactly, you know, in parallel, but, you know, if you've got that strong base, that strong foundation, and, uh, you know, you respect it, then you should be okay. And I think you hit on something that's really key is similar values. You know, people, we run into people all the time, have a much different value system than you and I do. And so it's neat to have that. And and recognize you're both going to grow. That's another great point too. So, so last question and we'll wrap up is it's still my favorite question. And you mentioned this a little bit earlier around this idea, but you only get to pick one thing. And that is, is what does Kurt Meyer know today that you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you? And you get to pick one thing only. I, I think, I think I, uh, I wish I would have, uh, known that taking a risk isn't a necessarily bad thing. I mm -hmm. think that, uh, you know, I, I, I always wanted to go the, the most conservative route. Um, and even, even if you take a risk and you fail, and you mentioned this before, sometimes you, you know, you take two steps forward and one back. Mm 
Yep. Uh, you know, you can survive that, especially if you do that and take those risks early in your life. I mean, right. You know, when you're approaching retirement, you know, it's a different behavior or whatever, but, uh, I would say taking that risk, you know, uh, again, you know, my background was such that I was raised in a, uh, conservative, uh, household where my dad worked for the big company and he was taken good care of, et cetera. And so I was comfortable with that. And I was comfortable for 20 years in the, in the corporate environment. And so, you know, taking that risk, just like you, you mentioned before, you would have done what you're doing now, hell of a lot earlier if you had to do it over again. Right. Exactly. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting too. There, one of the, I quote a lot of things during my talks of, of, research and, and studies that I've seen. And one of them was the five regrets of the dying. And there were several then that were in there about, I wish I'd been truer, lived a life truer to myself. I wish I'd kept better in touch with friends. But one of the things that fascinated me of the five was I wish I'd taken more chances. And that mm-hmm. includes the risk. And we, we tend to lead kind of conservative lives sometimes. And we think, gosh, if only I'd done this. So I think that's, I wish I'd have known that taking a risk isn't a bad thing. So, well, thank you, Kurt. That was fantastic. And let me tell everybody that's paying attention. A couple of reminders that I mentioned before. I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to mention it again. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. Always appreciated. And I do know that people are struggling with all sorts of life issues. And so I do have a program for you. My gratitude coaching program will give you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, your life's journey that you want to change, and this is a great program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude, all combined to ensure your personal success. My four-month proprietary gratitude program is priced at $4,500, and for my podcast listeners, you will receive an extra month of coaching for free. As I mentioned earlier, any questions you have about that or the keynote speaking or the coaching, you can get me at thatgratitudeguy.com or email at david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And one final thing, a lot of people ask me about my Monday morning minute. If you'd like to get that, it's a 60 second video that goes out every Monday morning at 6 a.m. You just go to your text and you text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And then the message box, type in gratitude guy all one word, and then you'll get hooked up for the Monday morning minute. So thank you so much for tuning in. It's always, Kurt was a great guest. It's always great to have all the listeners and viewers. We really appreciate it. And remember what I always end every podcast with, and that is, I'm that gratitude guy, David George book. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.